I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. Okay, today on Pro Mindset, we have a Denver Bronco defensive lineman, Dion Sizer. Dion, you went to CSUP? Yes, sir. Yes, I did. Okay, so let's just, just let's just get started. How cool is it to be in the NFL? Did you dream about playing in the NFL? Yeah, you I did? definitely did. Yeah, I feel like, like every little kid growing up playing sports with the backyard with your friends or recess, you know, playing, you always imagine being like those big name guys in the big games. And so I definitely had dreams to play. Who was your idol? Oh, Deion Sanders, because one, I was named after him. Um, oh, you were? Yeah, I was named after him. I loved Michael Vick watching him play. I loved watching Michael Vick play. play. So I feel like those were my big ones when I got into football. I was always, uh, growing up though, I was a big basketball guy. So I definitely wanted to be, I was a kid that wanted to be in like the NBA first and then NFL second. You know, I wanted to be like a, kind of how like, like Deion Sanders was. I wanted to be in both. Kind of like, well, he was MLB and then NFL. I wanted to be basketball, football when I was a kid, obviously. Okay, so I'm a big believer in dreaming. And so you were dreaming. Mm-hmm. And you picked two really awesome, you know, guys to model after. Um, d- did you ever play anything besides line? Were you like a running back when you were a little kid? Did I you- was. I was a safety because, like I said, uh, Deion Sanders was one of us. I wanted to be just like him. I was a safety in corner, so I played DB. Um, let's see, I played running back. I played quarterback. Um, but this is all like little league before us. Like they really like if you throw it ten yards accurately, you're the quarterback on the team kind of thing. And then I didn't actually, I played flag football growing up. I didn't play tackle until I was in high school. And at that point is when they put me at, uh, it was, I was a lineman. I was a D lineman in high school my freshman year. Stayed that way from fre- like high school, college, and all of that. Where'd you go to high school? Where'd you graduate from high school? I graduated from Eagle Crest High School in Aurora, Colorado. Okay. So <clears throat> coming out of Eagle Crest High School, how many football offers did you have? I had... Three and they were all D two. I had talked to some Division one teams, um, but I didn't actually get serious about like, you know, like thinking about it because you know as a kid you're not really thinking about it all. Blah, blah, blah. It wasn't until my junior year of high school that um, we had a kid that was a, our I guess a kid, but uh, we had a guy who was older than me, a year older. He was, he was a senior, I was a junior. He was getting uh, recruited by Wyoming, and he was like a big name guy. Got like the Colorado Gold helmet, I believe. And, um, What's his name? Xavier remember? Lewis. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think Xavier Lewis was his name. And uh, he saw a lot of schools were coming in, and they would look at him. And then, you know, obviously when they look at one, they kind of look around. And so I had talked to a lot of big-name schools in the process. And then um, I had talked to Wyoming for a little bit, but never really had any kind of, like, really back and forth, back and forth. And then my senior year, I started getting like, oh, man, like this is serious. This is real. Like, I started, like, really being like, man, this is it. And so I started getting more and more, but it was more from the Division II schools. And it was like the local ones, like Pueblo Mesa. There was a couple in Nebraska. I can't remember the name at all. Probably Shadron and Cody. Yeah, okay, that's what it was, yeah. And then um, uh, Adam State as well. But Pueblo was the first one that I went into a visit for. And my plan was that I had them like lined up like every weekend going to a different school visit. Because I've always heard the stories like you got to go visit out everywhere, you know? Went to Pueblo and then met the coaching staff, saw the facility, saw the work ethic they did, saw how they go about their day. And I was never one for like the big flashy, flashy stuff that, that they all have. Pueblo had like, at the time, they had the best record. They were showing that they were winning and I definitely wanted to win. And uh, when I went there, met the coaches, met the defense, or saw the defense, how they were doing it. And I was like, yeah, like this, this is where I want to play ball at. And so I signed up at Pueblo, played for uh, Coach Riston. Don't know if you remember him, but great guy, great coach. And uh, Coach Hughes was the defense coordinator at the time. And uh, hell of a coach as well. And uh, then uh, Coach Leo, Leo Meaty, he, uh, you know, rest in peace to him. He passed away recently over the last like, year or so. And he was a phenomenal coach, one of the best, like most influential coaches I've ever had. 
and you know talking to all of them on my visit basically sold me on it plus it was close to home so my mom was happy and then um went there and that like don't regret my decision whatsoever <clears throat> okay so Dion you you didn't get a you didn't get a scholarship offer from like guys like Clemson and Notre Dame and Alabama. Nope. Not so anything. how do you go to the NFL from CSU Pueblo? Honestly, the work ethic that they set up there and the le and the legacy we always there we always say have a saying out there is tradition never graduates. And when I got there, they had, had they had sent um, Mike Pinnell and Ryan Jensen to the NFL. So they were like, that is tradition. We send people to the NFL. We send people. We let them know that. Uh, put like CSU Pueblo is a powerhouse that is a great school that no matter if you're division one division two or you can be playing on like ESPN on the top or you can just have people have to stream to watch your move or to watch your game you know you can make it as long as you can play and CSU Pueblo makes it so like you know the coaches and everything they get you ready to play you just have to have the mindset for it and I think what got me from CSU Pueblo to where I'm at now was one, the coaches, two, the work ethic that they set up and then the discipline and just seeing the guys ahead of you. If you see someone in the exact same situation as you make the most of what they can do, it's such a powerful setting for you just because like when you see that, you feel like you can do that as well. You like that imagination you had as a kid, it kind of brings it back. Be like, man, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, and then like you're next to these guys and I was like, man, I remember running sprints with him and I was beating him in the sprints or I remember lifting with him and I was just as strong as he was, you know, like what is it that I can do that? Or what is it that he does that I can do? And I remember the most recent one that went after me was Morgan Fox and mm -hmm. he just signed a good deal in Carolina, but he was playing with the Rams and everything. And I remember talking to him and asking him like what the biggest thing was. And he was like, honestly, if you play your heart out and everything else like that, football is football. No matter where you go, like if you if you can play, you can play. Like, and he told me technique was the biggest, like another wing thing that was like a big jump. So I worked on my technique, and then I remember him saying like people like, obviously they're bigger, stronger than D two, and there's a big jump, so get bigger, stronger. So I worked on that, and being able to talk to him, and then my defensive line coach, uh, my senior year, my junior and senior year of college, was uh, Coach Herm Smith. We used to call him Big Herm, but uh, he played in the NFL and the CFL. And him and his knowledge, like him being, bringing all that knowledge to me, helped put in that mindset of what it would be like, what I would have to do to get there. And like basically comparing what I have been doing to what I need to do to get to where I want to be. And to where I want to be is like just in the door. You know, there's a whole other stuff that I still have to do in order to make sure I maintain that. It's like you want to work hard to get there, but you got to work harder to stay there, you know. And so I would just say the work ethic that Pueblo sets is one of the like hard like it was some of the hardest workouts i remember the first workout i went to after the workout was done i remember like I, I like sat in my locker and then i like went straight to sleep but right there i went straight to sleep went, missed my like second i think it was like the i can't even remember when but i think i missed my like one of my first classes and so i was like terrified i was like oh my attendance and stuff but i was so tired after that i was like oh man so this is what it's like so i was like you know getting my mind right for to be able to work and do that well, let me share something with you that I've discovered from working with NFL players for 30-some years and watching guys that didn't get drafted play 10-plus years. Yeah. And having and seeing guys that are drafted in the first round play like three years. Mm -hmm. And everybody thinks the difference is ability and talent. Never is. Yeah. It's their mindset. And so I've created this mindset, pro mindset model. Mm -hmm. And the components are your identity triangle, your passion battle, your motivational response, your construction zone, your lifestyle systems, and combat readiness are, the, are six of the seven. And so in identity, what I find is that some guys don't have the, don't have the belief in themselves that they need to play in the NFL. It doesn't matter if they get drafted or not. They don't believe they, they, no. they belong. So guess what? You cannot perform inconsistent with your belief. So if you don't believe you should be there, you'll perform in a way that they'll ask you to leave. Yeah. They're going to tap you on the shoulder, so see, go see the big man. They're going to ask you your playbook, and they're going to take you on a shuttle to DIA, and you're going to go home. And in your case, you just drive home, yeah. right? At the end of the day, your identity to me is the most important thing. So there's a reason why some guys can come in the league and start from the jump. They don't have to test the waters. They don't have to learn the ropes. They don't have to figure it out. They just go in, dive in head first, and, and go. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And if they don't make it, they'll go somewhere else. Yeah. Okay? We got other guys that go in and think, oh man, I'm on the team now. I don't want to lose my spot. Well, anybody that has that kind of mindset is going to get cut. Yeah. Okay? And then the other two components besides belief in the identity triangle is your attitude and your confidence. So if you look at the ABCs of identity, it's your attitude, your belief, and your confidence. Mm-hmm. And attitude is the energy. It's the, it's the mojo you have. It's the body language. It's how you respond to the football assistant, the quality control coach, the big man. It doesn't matter who it is. It's, it, it's how you interact with your teammates, yeah. right? Yeah. And then your confidence is how you feel about what you do. And football's a negative business. They don't pat you on the back. Yeah, no. Yeah. They always tell you what you, sh- you know, could be doing better. And so when the position coach is going over practices, he's putting up there saying, hey, Dion, look at your footwork on here. Mm-hmm. Look at your hand placement. Look at your effort, whatever it is, okay? And so the way you get better at your confidence is you work on your skills. You work on your technique. That's what Morgan Fox was talking about, yeah. okay? But belief to me is like if a guy has that, he can have bad practice, a bad rep. He can get his ass chewed by his coach. He didn't let it bother him. Yeah. And I feel like that, that's that's a huge thing to have is the mindset. That really sets a lot of people apart. And then, because um, we have, like, basically like you were saying, you get people who get constructive criticism and then they shut down. They just, they just it's like, oh, it's over for me. Like they sat there and then they're, woe is me. The ones who, you know, take it as it is and be like, okay, that's what it was, you know. Whether, no matter how the delivery it is, you got to look at the message of what is being told. I mean, you could have someone screaming, hollering, just cursing at you all the way. But if you don't, if you just take, okay, he wants me to step like this and put my hands here when I do that, then there you go. You focus on that. You know, you don't focus on how it made you feel. You can't have, like, I mean, you don't want those feelings to get, you can't have your feelings get hurt. You can't be sensitive especially when it comes to coaching and being and having constructive criticism because it's not always meant to be nice you know it's meant to it's meant to like drill into you how serious it's supposed to be and then those who take that and adapt with it like you were saying you know who have that mindset that attitude and the confidence in themselves to be able to get that done you know i agree wholeheartedly okay so you're going into your second season third season third season okay so what are you going to do you show up for training camp when on the 27th okay so you're looking at about two weeks Mm -hmm. okay so what are you going to do in year three that you didn't do in year one and two? Basically, going into camp, I'm going to shoot to show that. like, Because when we first got in, I struggled with the defense, the technique a little bit. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was foreign to me, a different type of technique of, you know, the, the, the technique that they work, like a mirror type reading type technique for my position. I struggled with that. And so for the last like year, two years, I've been working wholeheartedly on that showing my skills so when I go to camp I want to show that I want to show all that the fruits of all the effort what happens if they don't give you a lot of reps how are you going to handle that basically take the mental reps or do whatever I can get special teams reps I've talked to the special team coordinator try to get on there basically do whatever I can to get myself seen you know and what happens when the starter and the starter wants to take a light day so he's not hurt he's like coach my hammy's kind of tight yeah and we need somebody to jump in there are you that guy that's going to jump in there? Yeah, that's a blessing to me because if he wants to take that time off, that's more time that I can get seen. The more times I can get myself on that field and get myself to be on that film, that's more times that I can get that experience because the experience is really what can help you. A lot of the physical characteristics can be the same, but the experience can help you get to where you want to be because with the feeling it out, having more and more reps because if you mess something up, you get to do it again, you get to do it again, you get to do it again. You get to find out what works for you in the play. Because when you go do a drill on a bag, the bag doesn't move. The bag doesn't fight back. You know, everything can look perfect and crisp and clean on a bag. When you go against another human being that is doing at the doing the same thing at a professional level as you, it's harder. You have to do. You have to adjust to it. So when you do that and you go against that person, it it helps you realize. Okay, when I go against a person, I have to. You know, I have to shake a little bit more. I have to do this a little bit more. I have to carry the steps, two more steps. I have to fake in more. I have to fake a hand more. I have to be more stout here. You know, it, it helps you not only like self-critique yourself, but then when you see that on film, you get to see how you react at that speed, you know? And then you basically just, it, it helps you play better when you obviously play. You know, when practice makes perfect, mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know, I was like, yeah, you can get all the mental reps you want to get, but those physical reps are just are in, like indispensable like this you can't those it's like can't gold be, yeah like you the physical is is 
the best. Obviously, mental reps when you're not in, because you can't be in a hundred times, hundred plays in a row. You know, obviously, you got there's the rotation. Whether I'm in, whether I get two plays a day or if I get thirty plays a day, I am I'm honed in. I'm getting the mental reps on the ones I'm in. If I'm getting many, many, many reps, I'm asking other people, "How did? What do you think I could have done better?" I'm asking my coach after every team, after every team period, "What could I have done better?" You know, I want to make sure I improve that. If I have a day where I have a good practice, I want to find out how I can have a great practice. If I have a great practice, I want to find out how I can have a perfect practice. You know, and there's always things that I can be uh, that can be worked on. And like I said, I can always always be better at things. You know, uh, there's never a day in any day I've had ever where I've been like, man, that was a good day. I'm good for it now. You know, I'm done. I don't have to work at this anymore. It's all right. If I had it to the point to where I'm satisfied. Now, what can I do to the point to where I've had it perfected, where I can do it in my sleep perfectly? You know, whether if it's a cross chop or if it's a fake or if it's a spin or a dip and rip, you know, those are the fundamentals that I can continually create so that when, if I have it at a high level, when I get tired, every, everything drops, performance drops whenever you get tired, when fatigue sets in. The higher that I, re I rep something, the stronger it becomes when I actually get it. And then once I'm tired, it won't deteriorate. When my play won't deteriorate as fast. Is how I look at that. Okay, so how many times have you been cut? I've been cut ooh, three times now. What was it like the first time? It was hard because um, I didn't exactly get to do anything. I went, and that was the hardest part. Is it wasn't getting like it wasn't a cutting. It wasn't fair. Did you get a fair shake? I didn't feel it at the time. I didn't Probably feel didn't. as if you know because it was. But I, I know it was a business, you know, and I can't get I can't hold that against them. It's a business. You got to do what you got to do. I think what hurt uh, what made it so painful is that one is obviously the first one. Two, it happened before we had any kind of like actual camp stuff. We had OTAs and everything else like that. And I remember thinking to myself, I was like, man, I did terrible. Like I, I struggled with the, Like I said, I told you, I struggled with the technique. I struggled with that. Like I want to work on it. And I worked all the, like, worked all hard that off season. And then I would say it was like within that first week of camp starting, is when I got that news, hey, we're cutting you. And I'm just oh like, God. I didn't really get the opportunity to prove like, man, I promise y'all I got this right, I got that That pisses right. me off. Yeah. So you really didn't get a fair shake, and, and, and in some respects you did, but because you weren't ready for the technique and the, and the playbook, they moved on soon. Yeah, I mean, or it was it was a numbers game. I, I don't like I said, it's it's a business. You know, it is a business. It's a business, and like you can't hold them. I don't hold any hostility towards them or not what they did. You know, because obviously everything worked out in the long run. I mean, as it is right now. But I remember after that happened, I watched the game that they had because I was, you know, even though I had got cut, I have no ill will to my teammates or the coaches or anything, whatever it is, to the organization. I've been a Broncos fan. And so I watch the game and I see them playing. I'm over here cheering them on and everything like that. You know, even though I'm like waiting by my phone for my agent to tell me, you know, what's next for me and yeah. go on to my next I workout. Mean, and stuff. Exactly. You know, it was I was definitely sad. I was definitely hurt. And it was like, man, but like for me, I also felt blessed in the moment, too, because it was like whether or not, you know, this is going to continue or not. I had an opportunity to be a Bronco. You know, that's something that I can take with me at the end of the day, at the end of my life, whatever it is, I can say I was a Bronco. You know, I actually was able to do it. I was in the door. I can, whether or not I did well at that first first little bit, I was able to be there, you know. And then I was blessed. You know, I remember I was working. I thought, you know, football was over. So I'm over here, you know, creating my resume and I'm still doing workouts and stuff. And I get a call back saying, hey, we're signing you back. And I think it was less than a week from when I got cut the first time. And I remember as soon as I hit that, I felt a switch in my head. I was like, I'm going to prove everything that I can prove now. And on the technique that we had and everything else on those lines, I mean, I still struggled. I'm not going to say I went in there and I was Superman or anything like that. But I went in there and I tried to, you know, basically be like, I'm not going to let effort or anything else be on the table. Because for some reason, I remember feeling a slight regret for some reason after getting cut the first time. And I don't know what it was from, but I just was like, man, I wish, I wish, I wish. And this time I said, I'm not going to say anything about I wish. I'm going to do it. And if it's if I get one play or two plays, I'm going to do whatever I can. I'm giving them 100% at all times. And I was doing that before, but you still had, I had that regret just for him just getting cut. And I made sure to do that. And then at the end of it, I was like, oh man, like I don't know what's gonna happen or what's gonna happen. And then I got cut again for final cuts, but this one was for to, and then they had told me when they were coming, they were like, hey, we're bringing you back on practice squad, developmental, build your skills up and everything else like that. And I was literally like, I called my mom and my dad and I was like, man, like, 
you know, I'm got my toe in the door or something like that. You know, it's like just a little bit, but I'm in it. I have the ability to learn from so many great people. I got to learn from Vaughn Miller, Shelby Harris, Mike Purcell, uh, basically Bradley Chubb. I get to learn from all of these guys, like how to play and how to be a pro, you know, how to build my mindset so I can continue to stay here, not be here for a couple of weeks and then, then be gone. And uh, then the last time I got cut was at the end of my rookie year. It was like, I want to say it would have been like April of my rookie year. I got released after my rookie year was over. So we were about to report for kind of, it was like right after the draft, I believe, or right before. I can't remember exactly. And then I got cut again. And then that one was from April. And then they called me back in September. That was basically that. But during that whole time, I was. So were you in the practice squad last year? Yes, I was. Practice okay. squad whole year. Let me throw this out at you. There's a starter mentality. There's a 53-man mentality. There's a practice squad mentality. And there's a, what I would call, rookie get cut mentality. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel like you are now? Because whatever you feel is going to limit what you can do. Yeah. So if you're in that mindset, so this is what I tell guys all the time. Typical rookie mindset is, I want to make it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that fair? Is that a good? No, that was fair. I okay, that that's was, what most yeah. guys have, right? Mm -hmm. But in the 90 guys they bring in, let's say they keep 53, how many of the 90 didn't want to make it? I don't, I don't think anyone doesn't want to make Heck no, yeah, they all no, want to make yeah, it. everybody wants to make Maybe it. Maybe mama wants them to make yeah. it really bad, right? Yeah. So now, now look at this situation. You have 90 guys that want to make it. Mm -hmm. So if you're one of those 90 and you have a mindset, I want to make it, you're no better off than anybody else. Mm -hmm. You're like everybody else. So when you go into camp, every GM and that's worth his street cred already knows he's going to make it before camp starts. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to be one of those 10 guys that make it if they don't have you on the list and be sure that if they do have you on the make it list, you don't screw it up, right? So what I can tell you is that if you go into camp in year three with the mindset that you're going to start, that's your, that's your mentality. Mm -hmm. Forget the roster, yeah. okay? Have you ever been on an act, uh, active roster yet or just practice? Court? No, I've been on an active roster before. How many weeks? Uh, three weeks. Three weeks. So you got one credited season. Yeah. Right? So let's pretend that you, for sake of discussion, go into 2021 with the mindset that you're going to start. Well, if you're not a fraud and you're authentic with yourself, you got to act differently because mm -hmm. you're a starter. You got to know the playbook better because you're a starter. Yeah. You got to have better body language as you walk around the facility in Dove Valley because you're a starter. You have to talk differently to your position coach because you're a starter. You have to be more accountable. You have to help other guys out. So you ain't worried about your job. You're going to be a starter. Compare that mindset to the mindset of, I want to make it this time, which most guys in your shoes would have. Mm -hmm. I just want to make it this time. I'm, I'm smarter. I've been through, ran the block a few times. Got a little taste of it. I know my technique better. I know the playbook better. I've got a better connection with my coaches. And if you have this one, the second one, you may make it. Mm -hmm. You may not. But if you have the starter mentality, I'm going to bet you right now there's 95% chance you make it. Not 100. Mm -hmm. 95. Because you're going to relate differently with your coaches. You are going to relate differently with Bradley and Vaughn. You're the starter. Dude, you're going to talk to Vaughn differently. I'm not going to put him up on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to him and go, hey, bro, how am I doing? So think about this. If you go in with the mindset that you're going to be a starter, what kind of internal communication are you going to have with your teammates in the locker room? You're the starter. You're going to be the starter. I'm, going to just, I'm just going to guess. Vaughn, I got this. I got this. I got to clean this up, but I got this. If you go in with the mindset to make the team, you go, Vaughn, what can I do better? Vaughn, can you watch? Hey, did you watch my rep today? How'd I look? Am I making any sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Because what did you do at CSUP when you were the guy? Did was, you? Yeah, I was the leader starter. Yeah. You, did you ask some of the freshmen how you were doing? No. Did you say, hey, let's watch tape together so you can let me know how I'm doing on my technique? Not the freshman, no. Hell no. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what a lot of NFL rookies do? Hey, man, if you got a minute, I'd love to get your feedback. 
because you're going in to start. You tracking with me? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. So you do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You do whatever you want. I'm just telling you that your identity, whatever it is, has two controls over your career. One is it influences how other people respond to you. It, it influences how your coaches are going to coach you. It's going to influence how your coaches evaluate you. And it's going to influence how your teammates see you. And the second thing is, if you have the right identity, you're going to perform differently, mm -hmm. better, higher, or not. And what, I, what I, I've heard this, I've represented a lot of guys that have been starters. They'll say, hey, coach came to me. And teams like try to figure out between player A and play, player B. And they go, yeah, I had, I had a player B over at the house over at the crib last night. And he ain't ready. He ain't ready. Because you know what he's doing? Hey, how am I doing? You freaking got to know how you're doing. Yeah. And you really don't give a shit what they think. Because once you start thinking about what they, caring about what they think, your identity is not where it needs to be. You don't believe in yourself because mm -hmm. you're looking for affirmation. Tell me, tell us, what's been the coolest thing of your NFL career so far? Coolest thing would have to be, honestly, being in it, being in the NFL, being able to uh, say that I play for the Broncos or I play in the NFL or, you know, I, I would say like one of the cool things in I always feel like, I don't know why, but it always feels weird when it, uh, it was about, gets brought up. It's like someone, like, I'll be in a conversation, like, what do you do? And I'd be like, oh, I play football. Oh, for who? And I'd be like, the Broncos. And I, like, it feels cool to say that, you know? And, like, being able to, like, know all the work that I did brought me up to that point. Like, that that was, like, it's cool to say that. Like, I really, I really love saying that. I know what it means to, to have that logo on my chest and to be able to go out and do that, you know? And be able to say that. I would say that's very cool. And then, honestly... It's the people that I've met during the entire process that have like being like being in the NFL uh, allows me to be to meet different people, people who have a lot of like different views on the world and different like aspirations and different goals. And I get to meet like a wide range of people and see how they go. But I'm, I'm a, like I, I love people. You know, how you go to the airport, and you just people watch. I am a people watcher. So I, <laughs> like. I'm, I love to like look at how people go about their day and then see what they do, what their work ethic is, what, what motivates them, and you know, and like being able to be around amazing people and see these, you know, you see these people on TV and everything, but then to be able to know them personally, I think is one of the coolest things ever, you know? And, you know, whatever, you know, the flashing lights and all that stuff like that, being able to be at this level and play football at this level. I think just being in it is the coolest thing. I know that's kind of like a wide range answer, but like. Okay, no, I like it. I like it. Let me uh, challenge you. Okay. Okay. Okay, Dion. That what you just described is very cool. Mm -hmm. But you know what would be cooler? Mm -hmm. Is that you're starting in the NFL and you're getting paid one of the top salaries on your team. Yeah. Okay. I, that would be a beyond blessing, yeah. Yes. And that's, that's so, the goal to work for. That's the goal to work for. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, for guys, you've already accomplished tremendously. You really have. You, you a pat you on the back, for real. Not everybody goes D2 NFL. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a bunch that have. I mean, there's a lot of guys that have. But the majority of the guys you played college ball with, they got real jobs. Yeah. Right? And the, and the players you played against in the RMAC, they got real jobs. Yeah. There's Austin Eckler, and there's a few guys like that. But 99 out of 100 guys have real jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So what you so this is my challenge to you: up level your goals because you've already achieved your goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. What you've done is impressive because you've gone D two NFL. But now that you're going into year three, who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares if you're drafted or not? Yeah. Who cares when you went to school or not? Who cares? Now it's about what, what's going what's gonna to happen in your life in 2021 and 2022 and moving forward. And you have the most influence over that than anybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's one of those things where I find guys, like I've had a lot of, worked with a lot of guys like you that have 
overcome those challenges and become ballers. But it's all here. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, a, it's a combination of your dreams, your motivations, your identity, your hard work, a lot of those things. And basically putting what your dreams are in steroids. So much so you can't tell your, your girl, can't tell your parents, can't tell your agent, can't tell your friends, can't tell the media. Because mm-hmm. if you tell them that's your dream, they'll think you're on crack. Yeah. They'll think you're like perpetually high. Like what have you been eating? Because you're, you, seriously? You want to go to the Pro Bowl this year? And then when you have those crazy dreams, then you have to look at, does my lifestyle systems, are they consistent with that? Habits, mm-hmm. sleep, studying your playbook, connecting with your coach, preparing for practice like it's a game, all these things. Is your work ethic consistent with that? Is your identity cons- consistent with that dream, that crazy dream? I'm here to tell you that if it is, God's got a plan for you. You just knock on wood, you stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Those things happen to those people. It's just that most people don't do that. What most people want to do is just make it. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever like been in the situation where you're like, you're. Um, they they talk all the time about you know shoot for the stars, maybe hit the moon. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Shoot for being the dude. Shoot shoot for being defensive defensive MVP for the Broncos in 2021. And then you got to you're gonna have a lot of decisions to make in the next couple of weeks, next six weeks. Oh, if I'm gonna do that, if I'm gonna be MVP of the team on defense, I gotta do a little bit more. I gotta stay a little bit later. I gotta be a little bit more focused. I gotta be a little bit less distracted. I gotta get in that playbook one more time. I gotta steal a rep or two. I gotta be an asshole to the offensive guard that's one of your best friends, but just for practice. Because, like when you got cut a couple times, I'm sure that I'm sure this happened. They passed the hat in the locker room for Dion. It was the, the Dion charity fund. And you got this nice little cashier's check for big mounts for Vaughn and all these guys are like, man, we like Dion. Let's give him some money. That happened? No. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> and when you're on the team and somebody gets cut, are you, you donating, donating to their charity fund? That's what I'm talking about. So when you got to be an asshole against offensive linemen, it's either you eat or he eats sometimes. Right? Yeah. Okay, if you were <clears throat> if you were speaking to let's say a group of college kids and you you know everybody in college wants to play pro ball mm-hmm. and you were the keynote speaker knowing what you know today that some of that stuff you knew before you got to the NFL but you got real smart this last few years mm-hmm. what would you tell them that would help them maximize their potential for success? To actually listen. And I don't mean just like listen to like the every little thing, but like a lot of times when the coaches say things or they do speeches, it's always the same story, the same thing. But like when you hear it, you're like, oh, they're just talking about that. They're just talking about this. But when you genuinely listen to the things that they say or a lot of the things that people try to give you like this, like the mindset conversations or the motivation conversations. You hear them and like, oh no, I have no problem being motivated. Like I say, listen to that and genuinely intrinsically look at yourself and see what it is that you're doing that is different than what they're saying. Cause listening, I like, I kid you not is, is a quality that is lost on, is lost now. People don't listen as much as that. You could tell somebody something four different times and then five minutes later, would you say, you know, and I think that's with a huge population, not just college athletes, but I definitely think if they do it in college athletes and you listen and you apply what you understand, like you comprehend what is being said and you apply it, like whether it's something they're telling you that's mental, something they're telling you that's physical. I think listening is by far one of the biggest things that's gotten me in any kind of like any the the thing that I've noticed that I made the biggest jumps is when I genuinely listen, not to like, 
you know, the big, like, oh, you have to do the step here, you have to do the step there, but, like, listen to, like, you know, how people do things, and then, like, think about, like, okay, they physically did that, but what drove them to that, and, you know, like, intrinsically look at yourself and then be like, why would I do that, why would this apply to me, why would this help me, and when you listen to somebody and you hear the things that they're telling you, because coaches all the time, they bring in speakers, they bring in everything, and, like, they're all the speakers are telling you the same thing, like, you know, you if you want to succeed as hard as you want to breathe, you know, like all those types of motivation things, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 I want to work, I want to work. And then an hour later, they're going out to the club drinking, you know, they're not listening to it. Like it, they'll apply it when it's convenient, you know, it's like, oh, I want to succeed in the game. It's not I want to succeed when you're going to sleep at eight o'clock or seven o'clock at night because you have a five o'clock lift. You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't apply. To, it only applies to them when it's convenient for them. You know, but when you listen to it and you genuinely apply it, like people know, like the coaches that usually, like most coaches, I will say, good coaches know what they're talking about when they're giving you knowledge. It's because they know what it would take to get you there, at least the good ones. And and most ex-players or keynote speakers, when they're telling you knowledge and giving you these things, you know, a lot of people want to just be like, oh, you know, they're saying the same old thing I heard a week ago. But like the reason so many speeches and motivational things sound similar is because it's a very simple topic, like those things work. It's not rocket science to know what the process is. Like everyone tells you the process, whether or not, like you were saying with the mindset, the people who actually have the attitude and apply it are the ones that see the biggest re results from that. So I know it's like a simple term, but listening I think is something that I think is invaluable and literally is just go above and beyond in my opinion. Here's what I can tell you is that and you've experienced this. You you go from college where you're taking all the first team reps, mm -hmm. and you go to the pros where you're not taking any first team reps, yeah. and you're only getting a couple reps. So we took we call the, all those other reps mental reps. Mm -hmm. You get to choose whether you're going to take them or not. And that's a choice that every player makes when he's on the sidelines. So if you know the play sheet, you know the play call, you know what you're supposed to do. You watch the guy that's doing what you should be doing if you're in there, and you're being constructively critical with him on. Hey, he did this right, but he did this wrong. Mm -hmm. So candidly, based upon how the NFL installs their, their um, schemes and the way they do their practices, every single player in your position room could take every single rep in practice. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking physical. I'm talking mental. Yeah. Every single one if they wanted to. But I think guys get tired, they get fatigued, they start thinking about other things. And they don't get the value of those mental reps. And then the second part of listening that I'm going to piggyback on what you said is that coaches sometimes like to hear themselves talk. I understand. Yeah. But coaches like to coach. So what do coaches do when they coach? They're sending a message to a player to help him get better. Okay. So if you're in a you're on the sidelines and your your D line coach is coaching somebody else up, you have a choice. Listen in. Listen in. Always take the message, right? He's in the position meetings and he's criticizing this guy for doing X, Y, and Z. They're like, okay, he didn't like that, and he's complimenting this guy for doing A, B, and C. Okay, he likes that. He will tell you the secret code. He'll tell you what it takes to crack the code. But what happens to players is it's, very it's easier said than done. It's easy to say, I'm going to mm -hmm. take all these mill reps. It's easy to say, I'm going to listen. It's easy to say that, you know, I'm pissed off. He's not coaching me. He's coaching this other guy. I wouldn't be butthurt. i just go, okay, what's he telling him? Because he's basically, that's, he's telling that guy and you what he wants. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So if you go to school on, on all that stuff, in a short period of time, you really know what your coach is what you know what he's putting down and what you should be taking mm -hmm. right yeah or you don't listen and you don't okay um wrapping up here's what i'd like to uh i'd like to ask you something and share something with you dm your career is going to be over at some point in time mm -hmm. okay could be 10 years from now could be tomorrow could be any could day be 10 minutes from now yeah right what do you want to do to make sure you give yourself the best odds and probability of making it that you didn't even think about doing until we had this conversation. 
because I'm challenging you to dig deeper mm -hmm. and to do more, be more, believe more, perform higher than you were going to. And now that I'm doing that, you may go, bro, I got this, man. I, I got this shit in the bag. I, I'm good. And that's fine. But I'm just saying you're on the eve of trading camp. Mm -hmm. What is it that you got to do that's going to put you in a position to achieve more than you would have otherwise? I say get my mind at a higher level. Um, thinking of evaluating myself with attitude. Basically... Train my mind as equal as I train my body. Amen. Got to. Yeah. And I, you know, I do those things, but to do them at a higher level than I have, you know, don't do the same things I did a year ago. Do whatever I can, you know, really challenge my mind. Like having the conversation challenges my thinking. Challenging my thinking will elevate my mindset, you know? And so <clears throat> I think elevating my mindset and challenging my, my, my mental is something that'll be astronomical and changing how someone can play or how I can play physically, personally. Okay. So, so I'm going to give you one more idea along that same line is to either make a video or a journal. You being the best version of you. Day to day, rep by rep, on the field, in the facility and meetings, at home, and then whatever that is, you get to create it. So mm -hmm. create your own movie. Make sure you're the star of the movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, make sure that no matter what the circumstances is, you come out the hero. You're the Superman, and and you can anticipate the things that are going to happen. Not as many reps as you thought. Um, somebody else that is below you on the depth chart is blowing it up and getting a little bit more love than you are. Mm -hmm. There's like four thousand things that it could be, right? Yeah. Any of those things, you come out successful. You get you pull a pull a muscle the second day of training camp. In your movie, you still do it. Mm -hmm. You don't let it stop you. Yeah. You know, what most guys do is they got a plan until they get punched in the face. That's Mike Tyson's Mike thing, right? Tyson, yeah. So what happens is they got this great plan, and then they get punched in the face with something they didn't expect, and then it's over. Bada boom, I'm good. I was I, I was in camp for three years. I got one credited season. I. Made a little bit of money last year, but it's over. Mm -hmm. And that's your identity for the rest of your life. And then you're hoping your agent can get your workouts and somebody else will pick mm -hmm. you up or whatever the case may be. Or you create that movie of you being Superman and every scenario you can think of, you are the starter. And then you act, walk, talk, relate, and work, and most importantly, perform consistent with that new identity. Mm -hmm. You might find yourself getting a little bit more effort, even though you already thought you were giving it every, everything you got. You might be studying a little bit more. You might be uh, hanging out with some of the guys that are starters because you see yourself as a starter. Because this is what I see with rookies. Rookies hang with rooks most of the time. Mm -hmm. And rookies that are undrafted hang with rooks that are undrafted. And you know why you do? Because they room you with them. Mm -hmm. They put you together. They put you together. So now all of a sudden you become friends. Guess who you're eating lunch with? The cafeteria. That guy. Mm -hmm. the majority of those guys are going home. So what you got to do is you got to move out of that neighborhood and start sitting with the other guys. Because then the coaches will walk by and subconsciously they see you Sitting across from Vaughn. And all of a sudden it's, dude, he's one of our guys. Then they look over at that table and they just give a little glance like, yeah, maybe next year for those guys. So you were probably that guy most of the time because most guys are. Mm -hmm. So you got to step out of your comfort zone and step into the, a, a new neighborhood with a new mindset with a higher, basically a bigger dream. And then see what happens. I already know what's going to happen. I already know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen a thousand times. If you do what I said, you'll, you'll, you'll be running out of the tunnel opening game. You won't be on the practice line. You'll be running out of the tunnel. So I want to wish you good luck. Thank you for being on Pro Mindset.
guys. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, man. Good luck to you, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right, bro. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. You can follow us on our website, promindsetpodcast.com, or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Pro Mindset Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.